Hey, I'm Madeline Butini, the host of 1800 Mad Butt. I'm a visual artist from Australia on a conversational journey to call up and talk with the best artists, entrepreneurs, and visionaries of our time. Join myself and my guests as we unravel the stories behind their breathtaking creations and groundbreaking businesses. Make sure to check out our Instagram for extra show notes. You can view it at 1800 Mad Butt. All right, cool. Let's get into it. Hey fam, before we get into it, I want to apologize. Last month was a bit of a throwaway. For full transparency, I had some last minute cancellations and no capacity to find replacements. But this month I have two incredible interviews. The first is with Michael Delaney and next up I'll have Phoebe Paradise on. I also want to thank the 10 beautiful people who have taken the time to leave me a five-star review. Thank you so much. This is incredible and amazing. I really, really appreciate it. If you'd love to show support for the show, please leave a review. Follow us on IG at 1800MadButt and follow the artists we interview. And of course, share this with someone that you think will love it. And just a little PSA, I have some cute merch, which is live and on my website. And buying them goes towards supporting the podcast. You, let's get into it. Hey, Michael, how are you going? Good, Madeline. Thanks for making contact. No, you're so welcome. I love your art so much. I think it is so gorgeous. Like, this is mm. the part of the podcast that I hate because I wish I could, like, show people art. But I'm going right. to tell people now to head to your Instagram while they're listening, yep. while we're talking about it. Um, so let's just jump straight into it. So yep. tell us who you are and what you do. Well, I'm a, I guess I, um, I've been a club owner, a nightclub owner for a lot, a lot of my life in Melbourne. Uh, I live in Sydney now. I studied fine art when I was, you know, late teens, early twenties and got into doing, uh, interior design in hospitality, um, after that. So I thought I was going to be a world famous artist you know, off the bat. And then I got sidetracked by running nightclubs. And then I guess maybe about five years ago, I started painting again because I realised my drawing skills were so bad. Like I was doing interior design jobs and clients would ask me to explain what I was talking about. And I'd draw like a, you know, a a two-year-old child. And I was like, I've got to start doing some kind of exercise to connect my brain with my hand again. And um, I started doing sort of more like, architecturally sort of um perspective kind of paintings you know as a as an exercise and then i started putting you know characters into them and just started getting really in, into it you know and i'd come home from work and i'd paint all night you know and um yeah. kind of became something i couldn't wait to get home to do and um i guess since then it's become a sec like an equal part of my career, I guess, like interior design and um and um painting. Yeah. Also, sorry yeah. about that. That was just my boyfriend leaving. Very loud. Oh, okay. You know? <laughs> well, leaving for good. <laughs> <That's what> it <laughs> <is>. <laughs> it's so funny because I'm calling this podcast title um, "Paintings Through Enigmas" yeah. and something like that. And so that was really funny. No, he's gone for a run. He does his whole. Okay. Yeah, loves loves to be in that sweat mode. Um, yeah. Did you have like the most amazing story? Like, how sick being like a club owner and doing yeah. interior design and yeah. studying fine art? Like, I think fine arts informed everything. Like, studying fine art informed everything I do. Like, the way I look at interior design is like kind of building a backstory about what it's meant to be, what potential, you know, any element could be thrown in there, you know, but it's it's got to knit together in a, um, not a narrative, but in a, um, a thematic way, in the way that I guess you interpret art through studying fine art, like you contextualise it, you, what are the, what are the materials, you know, what, what kind of environment is it, what kind of era or, you know, kind of, um, what kind of brought about these choices, whether it's colour or materials or shape or, you know, scale or whatever. I think applying that to um, interior design has really worked for me as opposed to studying interior design where it's about um, 
what tiles are you know available today or you know what's trendy you know like in restaurants today or something it's not something i um look at or think about i, I look at the project in terms of what the owner is trying to achieve or you know um mm -hmm. what what it is you know yeah and i yeah. guess you could also say that like a little bit of that is like a bit of data too like 100%. Looking, yeah, yeah looking from what you've done before yeah Oh, for sure. And like, yeah, the nonsensical things are sometimes the most memorable. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah I, I think I go to some venues these days and I'm like, oh, it just looks like another venue, you know, yeah. and then I go to like a sick venue with all these different stuff. And I'm like, wow, this like it really lasts in your memory. Yeah, I think, I mean, especially for, you know, people, some people don't want to take risks. And when you don't, you're probably going to go out of business you know um yeah. I mean you've got to be sensible as well but like um I guess I don't know I I like things that are a bit more um edgy or interesting <laughs> yeah no yeah. that's great that's why I love your art you know <laughs> yeah, yeah so let's jump into your creative journey so we've kind of touched on a little bit of it but yep. let's talk about when you first started expressing your creativity and I mean this through like the multifaceted that you do like through your DJing, through interior design, through painting. Yeah. When is, like, when could you pinpoint the first time that you were like, man, I'm going to start painting? Um, I think my mum was always really encouraging of creative stuff, you know, and um, I, I was with that kid who, you know, in, prime, in preschool put on plays, you know, demanded that um, everyone would come to my house and watch a play that I'd put on, <laughs> you know. Um, I was always... I'm an Aries, I guess. So, like, um, I'm gonna be the best, you know. Like in my head, you know, whether it's whether it, the the other um, star signs <laughs> agree, you know. So, I think I've always wanted to be. I used to play in a band. I, you know, um, I produced electronic music. I ran, you know, and I sort of through all that started running nightclubs. But I, if I was gonna build a nightclub, I was gonna make it by hand, you know, with me and my friends, and um, and kind of like create an area that looks like a Robin Hood movie from the 30s, you know, and then cr the other area is a completely different um, scenario, you know, and just for the joy of, you know, um, it being, I, I, I think that, like when I had my recent show, I kind of um, decided to sort of pick four words that I thought sort of encapsulated what I what I sort of do and um I think dataism has always been a really strong one for me you know um just the the idea that everything is already been done you know and that um painting is dead you know all, all the things in the past are sort of dead that constant is always been there for me and like kind of when I've done something I leave it behind you know like sort of always I guess moving forward hopefully, you know, creatively, like, um, would never want to, you know, um, have a reunion night of a nightclub that I've run because it's, that happened, you know, 10 years ago. Why would you, why would you try and get, you know, 45, 50 year old people around to dance until 12, 12 AM instead of like 10 AM, <laughs> you know, it yeah. seems like, um, trying to recreate things is not something I, I do. So, um, I'm waffling a bit, but I think um, that sort of creative energy has always been my thing. Like, I, you know, I used to make things all the time when I was a kid and sort of get to a point where I was quite good at it and never do it again. You know, I ran, made furniture, you know, um, and all those skills have sort of ended up informing all the things that I sort of do now. So I think, I've, I, think I was born like this, <laughs> in, yeah, you know, yeah. in short, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's like incredible, that sense of like being able to let go of things. And you said yeah. that your mum was an influence of yours. Was she a creative person? Yeah, she was like a, a poet. And um, she would also, she's really, um, she made some really great um, clay, really beautiful, like um, Lalique kind of clay um, sculptures and stuff. And she was always, always drawing and stuff, but all, mostly being, wildly supportive of me and my sister my sister and I went to art school together and um so I imagine the joy of having two um, you know two creative kids who were never really going to become you know 
look after her, or, you know, become a lawyer or, you know, whatever was, um, was, and she, she, um, was really supportive of that. It was the best thing ever for her to have kids like that. So we always felt supported like that. So, you know, it just felt, um, like I didn't, you know, was never going to do anything else. Yeah. I'm so jealous. I wish my parents were like, you should go to art school. That's your best subject. I didn't have that conversation yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. So that's I kind so of dropped all these. I dropped every subject pretty much in um, HSC except for, you know, sculpture and, um, you know, art and English lit and just didn't do anything else. I knew, like, my dad was devastated. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I'm so jealous. Um, so what's like one of the first things that you can remember making? Um, no, like I, um, that I, yeah, I, I I definitely, I made things that were exercises in working out how to make things, I think like, um, and like, what does paint do if you, you know, like to mix it to get, you know, like just messy, you know, messy sort of stuff. But I think when I was like in, you know, mid high school, I started doing screen printing and, and stuff. And I was really, really into it. I was really into pop art and, um, and I kind of made pastiches of, you know, Jasper Johns and, um, you know, at Landy Warhol's kind of things like that I thought were fantastic. And, um, when I finished that, I, um, tried to get into art like art school when I was I was like 17 when I finished year 12 and um everybody said you just if you, you know you're obviously a genius but you know um you've got to um you, you have don't have a folio so they sent me to this amazing course that was like a one year course in Paran in the late 80s in Melbourne and um we our teachers were incredible like Howard Arkley you know Vivian Sharkler with all these like incredible practicing artists who were all at the pub the whole time and would take us to parties, you know, on the weekends where we'd make, you know, Nick Cave and all this sort of shit and, um, and take us to openings and introduce us to the, you know, that whole gallery scene and, you know, but make us feel like this is the whole class, not just me, but like, um, you know, make us feel really part of um, this very vibrant scene. And it was pretty wild when you're like 17, you know, going out like this and, you know, these people talking to you as if you're like a normal person was um fucking great like um and it was such a wild time you know in melbourne and um and then from there i went to um rmit for four years i think like um did a like a um degree in sculpture and media arts like a double degree and um i did postgrad there and then i thought um i was just gonna get snapped up snapped up by the art world and um you know, be in Venice, like, in, you know, six months. And um, that didn't happen immediately. And pretty much immediately someone offered me a job to um, fit out a bar, like, in the city. It was, like, ended up being one of the first sort of late-night bars in Melbourne, really, you know, um, popular and stuff. And I kind of that, – that's what I ended up doing for, like, 20 years, you know, yeah. <laughs> basically. Yeah. <laughs> Also, so for anybody listening, Michael does these like incredible fit outs and interior designs. I always see them on Facebook whenever you post something or if you post something new and I'm like, I'm like, man, I need to go down there and see some of these venues. Brisbane is so boring. You need to do a venue up here. <laughs> so oh, a friend of mine did Cloudland up there that um, is pretty wild from what I remember. I, I went there years ago, but um, I think it's pretty remarkable from memory. Yeah, no, Cloudland's definitely fantastic. Yeah. But I mean, like, bars, though, not, like, huge clubs. Okay, yeah. yeah I don't yeah, go yeah. to huge clubs, you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get yeah. overwhelmed now. The, these days. Um, the venue I'm working on at the moment is my 50th venue. <laughs> oh my my sister made me, you know, make a list for a website she's making for me, and, um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Dude, that's such an accomplishment. Congratulations. Well, yeah, they're, they're not all there today. <laughs> Obviously, no. I mean, things chop and change. But yeah. it's like, that's still like an incredible feat, though. That's what happens when you're old. <laughs> Stop it. Also, it's... by the way, it's today's Michael's birthday as we're recording this. So thank you so much. Yeah, that, that's why I'm reminded. 
hence the highlight. So yeah. um, the paintings you're creating now, I absolutely adore them. Yeah. I love the use of block colours and the expressions. When did you yeah. start creating this style of art? Um, about five years ago, I think. Like, um, like I said, I sort of started doing architectural stuff, but then I started putting characters into them. And then I think the first painting I painted like that was a, um, a like Joan Didion is one of my favourite authors. And I did a, a painting of her that ended up looking exactly like my mum. And, um, and I, I sort of did a few of these and I kind of like had no real thought of like portraiture or, or anything. It was just sort of exercise in painting. And, um, and then I started um, becoming entranced with how, you know, they, they were very direct. They were like really the original paintings that I did were like straight on kind of portraits of someone looking at you. And I originally was doing women because I realised like in the end, like portraiture is kind of like self-portraiture. And like if I painted a man in this, um, you know, psychological state, people would interpret it too strongly as if I was a, it was a cry for help <laughs> that I was making <laughs> about myself. So I sort of just, you know, and this happened me, with me realising what was happening, not, it wasn't a plan, you know, sort of like just evolved. But I started doing these ones that um, I just really liked the directness of it. It was like um, you as the audience are looking at it, but it's almost like you're looking in the mirror, you know, even though it's a ridiculous looking woman that's staring back at you what psychologically it's talking about is could be asking you the question whether you are in the picture <laughs> you know like um and this is obviously sort of um stoner um uh philosophy you know but um and then like at the same time i started thinking that the titles were very important to them you know um that i remember one painting i painted that was this sort of like farrah fawcett looking woman who and it, it was called um the only thing I, the only person I hate more than myself is you. And she's looking straight at you, but you're like wondering whether you hate her. Like, you know, and it, I, like, I, I, that was a, the first sort of big kind of, you know, I guess, um, switch was flipped where I was like, wow, there's, there can be a great relationship between the title and the picture you know, where it's it's almost like a meme, you know, like where you look at the picture, you look at the title, you look at the picture, you look at the title and you kind of like, you know, where am I? You know, it's sort yeah. of become a bit disorientating and um, and I kind of got really, you know, sort of into that dynamic and, um, yeah, I mean, to spend, like I'd watch a lot, like when I'm painting, I have watch, have YouTube like movies and stuff like that on or interviews or something and sometimes there's a couple of people talking to each other and it's like, wow, this is insane. I'll take a million screen grabs and like use something like that as the basis to start from, you know, um, it's always the nuance of the expression. It's like, you know, it's generally meant to be quite like, as if this person is really realizing where they're at, <laughs> you know, without any, um, without any, um, barrier you know like social barrier they're just you know so sort of this idea that's deeply melodramatic and um tragic but also hugely funny hopefully like you know and this sort of blend like yeah no I I'm not, I, yeah no, you go sorry I think as well, like, um, a great inspiration has always been for me, like, um, thrift shop paintings, like, where you find something that's absolutely fantastic, you know, like, and because the ambition of the painter and the what you're looking at is so mismatched, you know, or there's something great about, I remember I had this painting that I've carried around for years of this horrible painting and on the back of it, it says $5 and someone scratched it out saying, don't sell for less than $2. <laughs> And it's like the history, the fact this still is around, you know, like, and I ended up buying it and I've carried it around for 20 years. Like, I kind of felt like I wanted my paintings to be something that someone would find like that. And they'd go, why would anybody paint this? You know, that was a very... But also, why would anybody throw it out? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it's like wedding photos you find, in, you know, in, the, in an op shop. So, like, wow, what happened? <laughs> 
No, totally. Oh my gosh. No, it's so interesting talking to you about your paintings because I've obviously seen a lot of them, but, and I don't know why, but I just, I fucking love them. Like, I just think that they are, like, obviously when you're doing that singular portraiture, like yeah. I think it was last year, yeah. I was digging those. And now you're kind of like expanding into these, like where there's two figures in it as well. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know what it is. I just, I just think they're fucking great. Like, yeah. Thank and you. I don't say that about like a lot of people's art. Like, I think it's good, you know, sometimes most people. Yeah. But this, I love. And I think you are right. I think it's because you've got that title, which I want to talk yep. to you about. Yep. But also, like, I think it's the block colors and the scenery. And, and yeah. I don't know. Do you find sometimes you go to like an art gallery and you look at some people's art and you're like, oh, that's, and no shade to these people because they do it really good, well, but, like, the hyper-realistic shit, you're just like, wow, that, like, takes a lot of master, like, like to master. Yeah. yeah. But where's the substance? Like, do yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like, for sure. I think, um, I, I think the struggle with technique is always a struggle, you know, like, I'm not a great technical painter and, you know, um, so often, like, early on in the painting, it's way better and you probably, you know, you're better off cutting your hand off and, uh, and leaving it. But I'm a, a constant fiddler and I'm not sure whether that always ends up in the right, right spot. And, um, you know, I think um, I've got a great friend up here, Damon, um, who is a painter as well. And like, he, he struggles with the same thing. Like it's finished way earlier than it's finished, but in the end, it's only really finished when you're hanging it or selling it to someone. Like, we're, you know, because if it stays in your house, you're probably going to keep painting on it. Like, you know, just trying, trying, trying to get it where your brain thinks it might get to at the same time ruining it, you know? Like, um, but I th yeah, I think there's a lot of great, you know, whether it's photo real or whether it's also about the size brushes you use. Like, I'm really big. Um, fan of some painters whose paintings you see on Instagram and you think, oh, okay, that's whatever. And then you see a, it in scale and it's actually like three by three metres and they're using a brush that's like, you know, five centimetres wide or something and they're making yeah. big, you know, fresh daubs. And my scale's different there. So if you're trying to make a big line, you know, it's a lot, it's different, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. Um, that's technical shit, you know. <laughs> No, but I think that's also like, and again, not to hang shit on anybody who has like mastered technique as someone who like cannot paint for shit. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think they're really great, but I love artworks that have like substance. You know what I mean? For like, sure, for it's sure. like the yeah. nitty and the gritty, and like you can you can tell that someone's just been playing around with it for a while. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know. I also, also, I think your technique's great. I think you do great shading as well. So, oh, <laughs> thank you. No, legit. So let's talk about the titles. So you were saying yeah. when you were seeking inspiration for those, it's sorry. Do you get them from like interviews and things, or was that screen grabs for the actual painting? Screen grabs for the um for the uh, subjects. Um, I don't like. I've painted a few paintings for commissions of real people, and um, you know, like. They, you know, they obviously understand that I have my way of painting, so it's always a bit of a surprise that someone would want, you know, to commission a painting, like a portrait of their dad or something, you know, painted by me. Uh, but I always, like, because normally I feel free to um, push the tragedy out, that, you know, or the exaggeration boat out, you know, and it's, it's interesting when you've got to paint a real person and sort of, like, try and really capture them without making them seem pathetic or something like but i think um that's why i prefer to use pop culture or you know or um found you know images or like um stuff like that because it's a starting point i draw it and then i don't look at the picture again and it's just really about the the way the eyes are looking at you or something that is great about the source you know and um i would you know, I've had people who want to sit for a portrait. I could never paint in, in front of somebody really like that, you know, um, because they would be totally shocked at how long it takes to get it to the, you know, um, the pop point where I'm happy. But um, but the titles are more like they could be song lyrics or something or they, they could also just be it just comes into my head when I'm painting it, you know, like um, 
I did this painting of this girl with two noses, and um, yeah. it's called like um, each nose has its, um, each, um, each nose that operates independently of the other nose and has its own free will. And I was like, I was painting, and I was like, this is so stupid, this painting. And then I just thought of the title, and I was like, this is fucking great because it's like she's explaining that she's got two noses and she's explained it 500 times you know like because people like it, you know well how come you got two noses well each nose is independent of the other you know like and it's just like um yeah like a freak you know moment. <laughs> <laughs> but um and sometimes I've, like i've got a i've got a file of lots of potential titles and um and sometimes like the painting's not working and then I find the right title for it and then it all makes sense, you know, um, which is like making music, I think. Like, um, you know, you write a song, but until you get the lyrics for it, um, you know, it has no meaning, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the, they might be nonsensical, you know, it might be absolutely insane what the, it might not relate in a meaning sense to what the picture is, but, somehow together you know it stings together sort of yeah yeah i understand what you're saying in the yeah. context of everything yeah, yeah. wow no you I, I fucking love it we're gonna move on to some business stuff oh shit i know i thought are you we... from the tax department <laughs> <laughs> no but i thought you have run many a business and you have run a very successful business for 20 years that (laughs) surely some people would love to. You've probably Um, come to the wrong place for that. But um, (laughs) I think, like, um, I think it's just about working hard, you know, like, because for me, I'm the worst business person you've ever come across in your entire life, without a doubt. Like, but I'm always, like, if I can make enough money, it doesn't matter. So if I work... I get more work, you know, like, and you get better at what you do, like, by working. It's like definitely with painting. If you so if you don't paint for three or four, a couple of weeks, you come into the studio and it's like you've never done it before. Like, yeah. but if you do it all the time, it's like you're fit, you know, like, and um, your mind is used to it. You know what to do. <laughs> you know, you know what colors you're mixing, all that sort of shit. But like, same with um, you know, interior design, like. Um, like in the end you're working with trade you know other trades and stuff like that and like um you just got to be organized often when i work on walk on a work site people just think i'm some flouncy you know art person who doesn't know what they're talking about and takes a little while to earn their trust which is always a great experience you know like and when 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 you've earned their trust by being prepared you know and like having it documented what you want to sort of achieve like they actually change their tune and they realize it's actually going to be fun and um a good project that they're going to want to you know like probably go to when they knock off you know and um and that's that's good too so i think like i think for me it's like i'm really personable you know like once people actually sort of get in that situation it's it's clear it's enjoyable it's like funny and um you know like i'm keen to let other people bring in ideas into that world because i don't i'm not an electrician you know like if they have a better idea about how something could work whatever but it's also um you know being confident with able to lead that team you know like if you walk into that space you've got that job like you got to do it you can't sort of go Oh, sorry, everyone. I've got to go. I'm freaking out or something. You know, like you, you sort of got to own, uh, the, you know, that that role you've got in that sort of like chain of people. You're meant to be leading that thing, so you can't let the builder go. Oh, what about if we do this differently? And it's going to look like a rendered grey bunker or something when that's not <laughs> what you, um what what you've intended. You got to put your foot down and stuff like that. But I think that you know. Yeah. Do you have if, such good insights? What are you talking about? You're a great business person. But that's not business. That's just like interpersonal shit. I think um But that is know. business though. That's leadership. Yeah, yeah. Right. True, I guess, yeah, true. 
but in terms of like like I'm owed um, seventy grand at the moment from these guys that I did a job for eight months ago, and um, so this is a this is a tough one, like um, because they're a huge company here, like in Australia, and um, they've offered me all this other work, which obviously I'm not taking until they pay me this original amount. But my sister is like taken to court, blah blah, and um, they. It, I know that if I did that, they won't pay me and they will never offer me any work again. So oh, I've got to just be patient and and be in their face about it, but be patient and not not threaten them. Because, at, like, at the end of the day, if I become a P under their mattress, they're actually just going to, like, go fuck him, <laughs> like, you know. So I've just, you know... This is a real tough one as like, you know, especially maybe in terms of your audience and stuff like where people owe you money, how how you play it. Like it can be really difficult. Like I had this thing with these people in Melbourne. I called them out on Facebook. Like in the in the in the end, like after such a long time trying to get money out of them. And in the end, they actually were completely broke and they couldn't pay me anyway. But they tried to turn it back on me as if it was creatives fighting with creatives and i was like hang on i'm not a creative fighting with creatives i did a job for you you didn't pay me and here's the contract and you know and um they ended up i got debt collectors onto them and everything and they ended up just going we don't have the money like and i never got it (laughs) oh my god yeah i know but um i I've never called anyone out on Facebook before and I it was one of those things where you get chills down your spine and I was like, you know what, these guys are fuckwits. Like I, I would not care less if I've never saw them again because of the journey of this pathetic arrangement, you know? I had to spend I had to get a lawyer and retainer and I was just like, mate, like this is yeah. the side of business that I do not envision being fun for anyone. No, I totally <laughs> Like, and, you know, you've got to work out whether you want to spend money after, good money after bad, you know. Oh, I was left with no money after lawyer's fees. Like That's I'm what like I mean, yeah. Zero. But at least now I know that, like, they, they've fucked off and they've left me alone because, like, yeah, this, yeah. this person was just taking me for a ride. Yeah. And I, okay. and I was at the mental capacity where I was just like, I can't be bothered dealing with it myself. Yeah. I was having decision fatigue and shit and I was just like, fuck it and just got a yep. lawyer and yeah, then yeah. now at least i have a lawyer that i can hit up if i ever need them in the future so yeah yeah cool. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. No. yeah yeah no fair enough like yeah it's oh. a tough one like and it's also like like you're talking about mental fatigue like you know um that's probably the most expensive bit <laughs> you know like and i've kind of like i read I mean, I'm not, I don't read a lot of philosophy, but I really like the art of war, like by Sun Tzu. Like, if you can't do anything, don't do anything. Wait, you know, get all your information together. If you can do something, do it really hard, you know, like, but don't let it worry you if you, you know, um, if you actually can't do anything about it. Like, with me, with these guys who owe me this money in Sydney, I really can't do anything about it. So, it, although it's, Every now and then I wake up in the middle and I go, what the fuck? You know, like, um, I know that if I'm persistent, but not, if I'm stressing out, banging on their door, crying, you know, like it all goes to shit. Like if I'm like patient and let them know that I really, you know, I mean, I think in the end as well, if there is other work with these people after they pay me, they'll be paying me up front. <laughs> now because of this relationship which would be unheard of you know like and i'll just get them to pay me a certain amount until i work it off and then you know they'll they'll pay me another amount you know and maybe the relationship will be great much better like next time because of me being patient through this thing like with them being unable to pay me you know yeah i think it's just got to be a bit like flexible with all these related we're all creative people like sometimes people have dreams they can't achieve or whatever but it doesn't mean they're completely fucked you know yeah but they have to they also can't make you work for nothing or you know um Mm. or sell you a dream that they can't 
pay up pay in the end or something, you know. Mm. So what have been some of your um, business wins, would you say? I think running nightclubs when they were really hot was um, uh, amazing. Like when I came up in Melbourne doing that, it was really new. Like, I mean, obviously Melbourne's had a huge nightclub scene for a long time, but the club, the main club, the first club I started that was really amazing was in, a, I think it opened in 2000. And um, it was pretty incredible for like about eight, six, seven years, you know, um, like world changing, you know, like it was, um, it was in V magazine, top 10 clubs of the universe, like, which was pretty what wild. What was the like, name of this club? Honky Tonks. Honky Tonks. Yes, I've heard about Honky Tonks. Yeah, oh. it was it was great, but it was kind of like, it was pre-social media, like um, mm. we were open six nights a week. If you, it was in the times where if you wanted to go out, if you wanted to hang out with anyone or talk to anyone, you had to go somewhere and you didn't really know if there was anyone going to be there. People had mobile phones, but, you know, most people weren't even across texting, you know, like, yeah. so like if you wanted to, if you were lonely on a Tuesday night or something, you had to go to the club, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and have, have a crack, like, you know, and um, so that, I mean, and apart from that amazing music and, you know, really amazing people coming through there and stuff, like, um, and I had a good run in Melbourne with a few clubs down there, like, um, getting bigger, you know, like, which was an amazing challenge, trying to do something cool, but, instead of it being 300 people now it's 3000 people yeah like was was a pretty wild you know transition but um that was really fun and made good money and was successful and it was great you know being part of that community music you know creative community in melbourne i was so into electronic music you know still am and um and just kind of really felt like we we're all at the cutting edge you know like not me being the, the boss of it all but just being part of this great world you know it was it was exciting yeah yeah man that would have been so much fun that's like honestly i used to be a little like club rat growing yeah. up did the whole like promo thing and then actually did some work with um at soho in king's cross doing okay. like event management yeah, and yeah. then um but used to love it like obviously still love like revolver and stuff yeah. haven't been there in hot men but um but man I, so did the tile, I did the tiles at revolver in the stairs shut up like i'd never tiled anything in my entire life like they look so good but like it was so incredible like because there were like so like when they were setting up revolver for the you know the first time and um like tiling and they're ca it, like everyone's carrying everything up and down the stairs like furniture pas booze like and i'm tiling like you know with all these people going past like never laid a tile in my entire life but doing it in full view of the owner the public you know like on and on also the these stairs are fucking steep no shit like it was yeah. so, so hectic Oh but that was God. like that's like an artist taking a job you know like i was like yeah. 20, 22 or something like <laughs> oh i'm so insanely je jealous like it just sounds like you know you've had this like super incredible like almost like is it like i don't know like stardust sprinkled like inspirational like beginning journey going yeah. on like this incredible art like opportunity yeah often to like but doing clubs and still being able to be like creative with like interior yeah. design like yeah. that's just oh a dream it, like, it is a bit, <laughs> yeah it is lucky it's it's interesting to because i like i said before i don't i don't, the best job's always the next job like mm -hmm. to me like or the best painting is going to be your next painting or whatever and um i don't um reminisce or reflect that much like on on this stuff but it's interesting talking about it with you like um and just like um yeah looking back no amazing i know and on your birthday too very rich oh exactly yeah <laughs> it's very historical <laughs> um okay so 
let's wrap up the business side of things. So what would you yep. have advice for other artists about business? What would be like your go-to hit list um, of advice? Uh, be professional, like, and, and put like, you know, like for a while I was doing um, interior design for um, Drink and Dine in Sydney. Like I was part of the company with my friend Jamie and we, st we did all these venues. And being an owner of a business as the interior designer can do whatever you want. Like, and sometimes it would can get a bit out of hand, you know, like how insane it is. Like, but like when you've got another, a different client, you have to really work out what they want. Like, and they obviously employing you because of what you do, but like not everyone needs, you know, the Mona Lisa, you know, the Sistine Chapel, like maybe that's not what they want. Like maybe they you know they want it to be different so i think one of the things is like an artist dealing with someone is like work out what they want you know like you know you could propose a fifty thousand dollar mural when they want to spend five thousand dollars on a something you know like and best to understand that and kind of deliver what they want through your own skills and you know vision and stuff but like don't compromise like but like don't propose something that you're going to get disappointed and angry about <laughs> like you know when they don't agree with it like um that would be one i reckon like um deliver on what you said you're going to do like don't propose something you, is out of you you know like is you've never done before or like um you know you have not you sort of got to research it all to, before you you do it like it requires some crazy materials or something you've never used before like don't accept a job like that just because it's money because you'll end up fucking yourself and you won't make any money and um, the person will be pissed off and tell other people that you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, that sets a bad reputation. We don't yeah, hear about yeah, those. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Um, and I don't know, like um, work, I think, be, like, be personable is the main one. Work well with everyone you're working with. Like, you know, um if it's a helper or a supplier or something, pay them properly, you know, be respect, be a decent person, you know, in the, in the situation. I think that goes a, a long way in this, you know, modern, modern world. Like, you know, being someone that people like to work with, be part of that team is, is, is important and makes it a good relationship for everyone, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's like yeah. last year when I had that, uh that uh lawyer issue i yeah. like magically like got this client when i was like desperately hurrying all my money together yeah 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 and then i got another job from them straight afterwards and i was like oh thank god <laughs> like yeah yeah you know, i was like fuck thank yeah. god i'm good to fucking work with otherwise yeah, that yeah. would have been so fucked yeah um, and, it, and it makes you feel better too you know oh totally yeah. yeah no i love that that's good just be professional be consistent don't be do nice. something but yeah be nice don't but don't be... compromise don't compromise either you know no. and, but i think you know um it's easy to be nice when you're able to do what you're doing what you proposed you can handle everyone you the, the mood board or whatever you or whatever you presented to them you've achieved you know and they go this is great delivered on time i will tell everybody else how good this is yeah I think that's how I've ended up doing 50 places, you know, like that I like, I haven't, um, I don't have a website, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. Just word yeah. of mouth, but, word of mouth. but yeah. also it's like, just to let you know, and everyone else know that like, you know, something like 86% of referrals actually and like lead generation comes from word of mouth. Right. So it's that's like, a good stat. Yeah. Well, I was, I've been redoing my, um, my brand strategies and stuff. Yep. Yep. And like doing all my sale funnels and shit. And yep. so I was like looking up stats to be like, how much word of mouth do I need to generate this amount of income? Mm. And I was like, oh. Well, that's good. I guess we can do yeah. that. Um, yes, yeah, something like that. I mean, yeah. it's like it's it's very high to be honest. That's a good tram in Melbourne as well. The eighty six. Is it all right? Yeah, lots of good entertainment on the um on the eighty six tram runs through Smith Street in um Collingwood. Um, 
yeah, it's cool. Oh, nice. I miss Melbourne. All right, now we're going to jump into okay. music. Music, so, okay. Uh, you got to get your bong mist hat on. Right. Um, so are you still going as bong mist with your... Yeah, hand? yeah, that's still my handle, yeah. <clears throat> Sick. Um, also, FYI, just like on the sly, I ended up buying a mixer the other day. Oh, right. I know. Dude, DJing is so fucking hard. Like, I don't think people understand. And, like, before I was like, oh, it's not that hard. Like, it can't be that hard. And Are then you using I was, sync and stuff like that? Yeah, I'm using Serato and I got the, okay. like, the FLX. I've never used um, that stuff. Um, I don't use sync or anything either, but, um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think if you, I mean, if, as far as I understand with, you know, sync, right, like on a, you know, a modern piney mixer, oh. you could pretty much watch a boiler and um, YouTube video and, and DJ that exact same set pretty easily, if you, you know, without um, having any skills whatsoever, you know, um, it, as long as, you, you know, you're tech savvy. And um, I don't know. Yeah, like, see, I'm trying not to use all the buttons that do sync things properly. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Like yeah, I'm yeah. trying to learn it so that I'm like teeing it up yes, at the yes. right time. Yeah. You know, because then yeah. otherwise it just, and like I'm trying to get the tempos correct. Anyway. So, so Rada, are you using, you're using like a vinyl platter kind of situation or is it like a, a CDJ? I don't know. I'm not, it's this big. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's like a CDJ. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, you could get Serato that it, you use it on, um, Technics turntables and it's like a um it's like a, a it's like a record you know 12 inch record but it's like a serato controller and you can use it like a vinyl record but it, it goes into serato using a digital file oh yeah some people do that like um you know because they want to seem like that they're a vinyl dj <laughs> yeah you okay. know, like they're, 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 they're cooler than someone who's not a vinyl DJ. Yeah. Look, I don't want to seem cool. I just want to be able to chill out in my own home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're and throwing, like no, make no. sick mixes. Yeah, I, yeah, if yeah, I, yeah. Like I was also going through my fucking arts and crafts drawer today or like oh, cupboard. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, I have too many hobbies. I need to stop with the hobbies. Right, anyway, okay. yeah. back to you though. But so as an old, as a DJ, <laughs> Oh, sorry. As a club owner, yeah. What is like the top things that you would say a DJ needs to do in order to be successful oh, and like wow. rebook? Okay. Um. I don't know. I like. I don't think there's a rule for that. Like. Um. Um. And to be fair, it's been a while since I've booked DJs, you know. So um, I think my experience of going out to clubs in the last, you know, 10 years has been way, like I've probably done more clubbing in my entire life than anyone in the world, like in the 20 years before that. But like last 10 years less. And I have been to events and festivals and stuff like that and been like overwhelmed by the sameness of um a lot of DJ sets like that seem completely bred to me on people watching stuff on YouTube of like Dead Mantle or like something, some big European festival. And they've downloaded all the tracks from that thing. And all the tracks are like massive build up, huge drop, ambient bit into the next record. Like, and it's like you could, it's like trains you know, running on time at the station. It's like there's no inspiration or anything. They're just, it's like a gym or something. It's like the, yeah. you, during this bit you're meant to do this, then you raise your hands in the air, then you chill out and talk to your friends and then it kicks in again. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. it's, it's just demented. Like it's, um, I hate it because the reason why I got into it was like um, had no idea what the DJ was playing, like, you never heard it before. You ask them, they won't tell you. They're like, you know, there's, they're playing, um, they've scratched out all the information on the record, so you can't even look at it to work out what the music is. So there's no Shazam, you know, and you go out to a club and you're like, I love the music that that guy plays or that girl plays. I'm going to go 
I, I, if I see their name on a flyer, I'm going to go to this party because I like that sound, you know, and maybe there'll be other people there with the, who play that sound, you know, and you gradually sort of work out the sound you like. Like, you don't like that. You know, when someone's playing that, you'll go into the other room, you know, like. Yeah. And but you had no idea what it was or, like, who made it, how it was made. Like, it was so modern and, you know, I remember the first, I went to this, like, one of the first Earth Corps parties in Melbourne. Like, this friend of mine came around to my house on Saturday night and was like, do you want to drive three hours to this place called Mount Disappointment? You know? <laughs> and um, I've got some acid and um, it's only 20 bucks to get in, you know? And um, I was like, yeah, okay. And um, I had $20, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, this would have been about 1992 or three or something. And um. We go to this place and it was it was an outdoor rave, but it was like three um it was generators, there was no toilets, there's no food, like um there's probably like a thousand people there, and it was like signposted with um fluorescent stuff tied on trees. You'd sort of get to a certain point, you had no mobile phone reception, you kind of have to just hear the music and drive towards it, you know. And Using I, like a Rapidex trying to see if you're on the right path or something. Totally, like. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's completely unorganized. I mean, it was all organized enough to happen, but there was no safety or, you know, um, you know, you'd stumble around and fall into a tree just because you couldn't see where you're going, you know. And um, but me and my friend took this acid and we lost each other straight away. And um I ended up dancing in the same spot for like eight hours till when it became daylight i realized i dug this sort of qu- quite a big hole like in the ground and um and like it was it was so magical because um com- coming from playing in a band there was no there was no idea where the the artist was you were just like in this environment with this incredible sound system but there was no like stage where the dude was and everyone's like, you know, going, yeah, the dude who's doing it. Like yeah. it's just, it was just like everyone's here for this sound, you know, and um, and I don't know what it is, but it, it's incredible, you know, and that was a watershed moment. But I think that's like how I sort of like want every DJ to be, like to sort of um, pick you up by the hair and do what they do well to the point where you're like really excited and stuff like or, i mean that's a dance floor dj i guess like there's all kinds of djs like i love a great backroom sort of dj just plays great music you know and could you know at a restaurant or something someone could be a great restaurant dj like you know because of their choice you know yeah but, um, i think that's why i wanted to get into doing like djing because i wanted to make my own mixes for when i'm doing my yeah. art yeah you know yeah. Yeah. What, you don't just make playlists? No, I do like to make playlists, but, like, I I really love books. Like, I think, oh, he, yeah, yeah. like, the tips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, ha- like, would, I've, like, rinsed all of his stuff so much that, like, I So can't... you're trying to do his sort of style, do you think? Not really, but I think, like, that kind of where, because I, you know, I love collage, so... I yep. wanted to try to put like some like old vintage movie sounds into it and like you know yeah, just yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. a bit avalanches a bit like techno yeah. a bit house yeah yeah i don't know i just i also thought it was another way to like just be creative and i guess almost collage in like a music you sense. could do that on screen though like without you know you, you could do that in there's a lot of programs you could do that in where you're you you sort of drag and drop things in and you kind of make a collage like that without having to do it physically because i think from yeah i've never i'm I'm in deep now with this thing (laughs) but i've never made a dj mix because like in my entire life like because i've tried a couple of times and it's just like i actually don't know why i would want to play these in this sequence because when i'm djing i'm doing it in a room and i'm playing them in this sequence because of that you know, and that inspires you to what you're going to play next because, you know, everyone just left the room, you know, or something like, and you've got yeah. to work out what you're doing. Like, and making a DJ mix in isolation, I reckon, is really difficult, you know. Yeah, but that's why I'm just doing it for me, you know. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, like, because yeah, yeah. 
I don't know, sometimes, I don't know, I just, I had this like, I don't know if it was an epiphany, I drank a lot of gin over Christmas. Right. And was it Christmas or New Year's? I think it was Christmas. And I drank a lot of gin and I got really upset because I was listening to this. Because you were drinking gin. No, because I was listening to this set that someone had made. Yeah. And I got really upset because I was like, no, they're doing it all wrong. Like, they're not doing it the way that I would do it. Like, you know oh, what I mean? Right, and right, right. so then I was like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to make my own fucking set. Yeah. You know, and I have my yeah. Spotify playlists and stuff and like, but I have yeah. like a thousand songs on each playlist. So it's yeah, like, yeah. can't find what I want half the time yeah. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, plus you know, I, um, yeah. You, that, that, have you ever heard um, the chill out by the KLF? No. You got to look it up. Like it's like iconic um, collage um, uh, DJ, you know, kind of piece, you know, yeah. and it's like, that was so, such genius. I would encourage anyone on your podcast to um, research the KLF, like um, yeah. these English guys, like um, some of the most re re renegade, like art, music, culture, you know, mm -hmm. stuff. But they did all this stuff, but they also made this album called The Chill Out. And it's like kind of like the benchmark chill out album. And I, I sort of started DJing in a chill out room at a techno club where you really people were like, overdosing on acid or something and they come into this room lying on the ground you know to to get away from the hard techno to sort of like you know until they pull it together then get back on the dance floor and so you end up playing all this like very odd you know um soundscape stuff but then sort of play you know nancy sinatra or you know like yeah. um some sort of like you play a techno record, play, but play it really slow, like, you know, super, yeah, nice. super slow. Like, and you, you, you play for like eight hours in this room and you're sort of kind of guiding them in this um, part of the party to um, through their difficult moment or, you know, or maybe they're making out, you know, or doing or whatever they're doing in there. Maybe, you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. <laughs> like that's, that's also the kind of DJing I really like, like, um, where someone's not trying to drive people to dance. You You're know, like the musical medic. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or a college artist, you know, like, yeah. um, you know, putting stuff in, where it's to play like Fleetwood Mac, you know, re like really slow, like something like Dreams, like at half speed. And like it, it would, people would start dancing. It's like 150 BPM, you know, <laughs> it was wild. Like, but, so I think being individual with DJing is where it's at. Like, um, you know, find something you really like and do it. It's the same with anything, you know. Um, don't play with everybody else plays. Like, don't paint your house grey, you know. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, I think a great DJ is someone who has, like, a unique perspective, you know. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah. Um, so who are you loving at the moment musically? Um, I listen to classical music almost, you know, all the time now, like, um, and I, you know, my mum really loved it. Like, and I, for a long time, I didn't understand, I couldn't, I've, I've found the format too odd. Like I, I like pop mm -hmm. in things, you know, meaning like if it's, I love it a bad pop record if it's really good at being what it is, you know, or like I love a great in, in independent music that is just perfect at what it is, you know, like, but the format of classical music seemed a bit um, ponderous and stuff like that to me. I don't know, like maybe an old, I felt like it was an old person's thing or something like, and um, gradually I've come to find it incredible. Like, um, Originally, because like you have, have no idea where it's going because it's unfamiliar, you know, and it's like you don't know what, what time it's from, like, but and you're just responding like straight up to how it's hitting you, like, and you find what you like and what you don't like, and you know, um, and you work out what 
place in the world, time in the world, this stuff comes from. And it's um, so, it's just so fascinating. The idea that people wrote down, you know, because like I played in a band, I don't read music. You know, you, you jam and you make up a song and that's, you know, that's how you make music. The idea that these people could write it down without like even having a piano in front of them and would be able to write it and, pe- and hand it over to people and they play it just seems incredible to me, you know, as, as a creative process. You know, so mm-hmm. like that's what I think about when I listen to classical music when I'm in the studio. Like it's just like the way of creating is so wild. Like so I don't really listen to mo- – like I mean I, the last modern thing that I really like is probably Slippered Mods which I think is absolutely incredible. Like um, I saw them at the Metro and Sydney. It's just so wild. Like that guy is the most incredible performer, you know. Mm-hmm. He's like James Brown. Like he's really camp and weird, you know. Like it's like James Brown mixed with Ian Curtis. Cute. Yeah, really cute. Like um, <laughs> and I don't know, like. I kind of worked out a fairly long time ago. I don't like going out to live bands because if I'm going to see, you know, a band, I want to see, I don't want to see ACDC now. I want to see them in 1975, you know, with Bon Scott singing. Like, and if I go and see them now, it would make me depressed. Yeah. But I think that also plays into who you are as a person, right? Going back to what we were first discussing. Um, you know, but yeah, totally. It would make me depressed as well, I think. Yeah. Although I did see um Dolly Parton a, a few years ago and that was fucking incredible. Yeah, but Dolly's still kicking it. Like you know, Exactly, exactly. She's, yeah. she's elevated herself since then. Best guitar player I've ever seen in my life. Like yeah, she's the most incredible guitar player. Like wild. I know. Yeah. I'm still really curious as to who her husband is because she never really nobody knows who her husband is. I've seen pictures of him. Oh shut up. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. He's got a beard last time I saw him. Does he kind of look like Kenny Rogers? I that's kind of it. yeah, like a little bit. Yeah. I've like always a, envisioned a, it to be like that. Kind of, yeah. But you know, yeah. like actually had that affair with that country music guy. Like no. He was on some weird show in Nashville. Like it was I think it was like a, a proper big, you know, um uh country music cabaret kind of thing and the dude who ran it was like an absolute legend and apparently they had an affair for years that everyone knew about and then she broke it off <laughs> oh hectic i mean yes. she's Dolly parton though she can do whatever she wants really yeah she could walk uh, down the road and shoot someone and everyone would be like no worries dolly it's all good for sure yeah yeah that's crazy yeah. so what band were you in sorry because the- it wasn't a good band that no one would be able it's probably not even on the internet um we thought we were fantastic for a while but it was one of those things there's like five people in the band no one could ever be in rehearsal and whatever and um after that first time i took acid and went to that rave i came back and i decided that i was going to make this music and i didn't need the band anymore and we had band practice and i said i'm i'm not doing this anymore mostly because like I think being in a band, like, it's so hard finding a few of the same people who think the same way and want to play the same way as you do. Yeah. Like, and when I came back from the rave, I was like, I, I'm just going to buy some gear and um, I'll be the whole band. But what did you play in the band? Guitar. Oh, sick. But you don't. you said you don't know how to read music. No, I don't. I like I know I know how to play a guitar though, but like yeah. I don't think you need to know how to read music to be in a band. True, actually. Maybe I don't know. I We probably most bands you only need to know a couple of chords. Like you know. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. That's so crazy. That was, was a long the, time ago. Yeah. What was the band's name though? I wanna like mortal. Brown An- it. it was called Brown An- Brown Anchor. Oh nice, cool. Well now it's on the internet, so yeah, great. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so now we're coming to the closing part of the interview. Oh, okay. Sad. Sad I phrase. know. But we're talking about the future, so it's fun. Okay, yeah, yeah. So uh, how does your 2024 and beyond look for you? Do you have anything interesting coming up? 
Um, I'm working on two um, bar projects at the moment. One of them in particular is going to be great. Like, um, same guy I've done for Mudaria and Piccolo Bar in King's Cross for this guy, Dave Spanton, who runs um, Bartender Magazine. And he's got this, we've got this new site that is going to be like, it's called The Hook. It's going to be like oysters, whiskey, and um, stout and champagne. Yeah vibe and it's like it's gonna be sick actually it's like 1972 san francisco english pub Ooh. vibe and um i bought this like like wildly overpriced like home bar shape like a boat that i'm like trying to work out how to cut the existing bar and jam it into it like that we're going to have all the oysters in the the, the hull of the boat you know that like oh. with ice and stuff yeah but um i always set myself these sort of projects like what a great idea and then it's like how am i actually gonna fit that together you know like cut them yeah. to fit and stuff i love the neon sign that you bought the other day that you I had oh. made oh it's so good it's so good yeah that's gonna be in the window like an opening oyster so did you get so you got that professionally made by a neon sign person yeah i've got this great guy um um, Don, he's like a Taiwanese guy, and um, he he's the quickest neon sign person. Like it's proper neon, not LED. Yeah. Like yeah, and um, he is a gambler. So um, if ever he gets a job, he completes it like as quickly as possible so they can get paid and get back gambling. Like, like it's it, it's the best deal ever. And like um, and yeah, he, he did a really good job. Um, and so- has done. I've used him for a long time. He's great. Yeah, amazing. And what's his rates? Are they good? Because when I got a neon sign done like years ago, like eight years ago, yeah. I got like my Mad Butt logo at the time. Yeah. And because I love Tracy Emin and I was like, I want a yeah. neon sign. Yeah, yeah. And it cost me like 850 bucks. And it was like, this bit, it's know. not cheap. Yeah. Like, um, not I cheap. Reckon, I think that Oyster was like, Two and a half grand or something, but like there's three colors and it has a um a switch and two it needs oh, okay. two um uh transformers because it switches between the two different things, mm-hmm. so it makes it more expensive. But like I think he, he's super reasonable. I, like I could put a link in the bio. Like, um, yeah, you know um he's great. He's really good. Like um if anyone and. I've had him do stuff for me in Melbourne where he drives it down and installs it, like, so he can go to Crown Casino probably. <laughs> oh, I love it. How good. He tried um, to um, get me to lend me him money one time at, with his van as um, collateral. And I was like, dude, I don't know you that well. Like, I don't need a van. <laughs> um, okay. Well, yeah. Reputation's a bit sketchy, but he does really good work. No, he's a good job. So... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't accept um... his van. Yeah. But don't, yeah, don't let him any money. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. So do you have any other shows coming up this year? Well, no, I just had a show um, with Carla Uriate, a friend of mine who um, is one of the owners of um, Cafe Frida's in Sydney, um, who's a great artist. Like, we've been friends for a long time and um, she had never had a show. Like, she'd been in group shows and stuff like that. So I, um, I said, well let's do one together then you know mm-hmm. and we it ended up being great like um we d- are not represented by galleries so we rented out this incredible space in paddington and um it was like mca it was like it was like one of these places it used to be the diesel store it's really like chic, kind of like chic space and um had a really amazing uh opening event there where she did this like performance poetry with Kieran Callanan playing this like soundscape amazing guitar shit and um so it was a real happening we had absinthe um and mm. yeah it was cool so um sold a bunch of paintings there and um I think I'm you know like when you do something like that you're kind of like whew, you know it's like the, um just need a breather and try and work a a bit of a reset or whatever like um i started painting these like hallucinogenic um landscape sort of paintings with less figurative elements in them you know and um which i'm kind of really liking but i i don't know i'm just sort of just gonna 
keep painting, like, but not think about a, a show yet, you know? Yeah, that's okay. No stress. Yeah, no, yeah, no, but you know what I mean? Like, um, you know, I'm, I don't have a definite idea of what I want to, where I want to go. Like, so I'm just yeah. going to work it out. Yeah. No, I haven't had a solo exhibition for like nine years because it's just like yeah. too much stress. I can't be bothered being yeah. that stressed. Unless yeah. like a gallery is like, we want to put it on for you. And I'm like, cool, I can just focus on making stuff and you can just deal with all the logistics, you know? It was, yeah, it was funny because like, because of Carla not having done it before, like, I remember we were driving to go and hang the pictures and she was like, I can't, I thought, I can't believe how stressful this is. Like, and I was like, what do you mean? Like, this is, it's kind of what it is. Like, and it's, it's stress, but it's also, um, excitement and you know um like you know it's inevitable you've set this deadline you know like which is always a good thing to do like have a have a deadline you know otherwise you could fluff around for the the rest of your life like mm -hmm. and um and like i said before it's the only time you ever finish anything really mm -hmm. like and then when you get there and you put them up and it all looks pretty good it's like but then you got the anxiety of the opening and like talking to people about it and all this yeah. stuff. But it, it's it's kind of like, you know, we kind of didn't really get there earlier. But like, I remember the first day at, at art school, um, this lecturer standing there was like about two hundred people in the room, like students, and the lecturer was like, "Welcome, you know, like out of all of you, probably two of you will end up being professional artists." Um, some of you become uh, teachers, some of you will give up and get married, some of you will um, not even think about it again. And I was like, oh, fucking as if I'm going to be one of these people who's going to be an artist, you know, like, but, and over the years, I've noticed, like, so often the people who succeed aren't the people who were great earlier, but they're the ones who persisted. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not saying this is me. I'm just saying a lot of a lot of artists I know who are you know I went to school with and stuff. They were absolutely terrible, but they persisted at it. You know, like yeah. um, you know, in whatever way, whether it was like dating the right person or working hard or um, applying for every grant and you know, kind of studio, you know, all that stuff. Like they're the ones who ended up. You Do you know, know what? I was saying this to Chris, my boyfriend, the other day, because, you know, we're in this cost of living crisis, yeah. um, world's turning to shit scenario and post-COVID world, whatever. Yeah. And um, I, was, I was like, you know, haven't made many sales lately, haven't really been pushing my art that hard. Yeah. And Chris is like, oh, you know, it'll get better, it'll get better, like, you know, kind of like hyping me up. I'm a very typically like pessimistic person when I get into those modes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, no, babe, it's fine. Like this is just the next wave that you got to persist through. Like yeah. people yeah, yeah. are going to drop out yeah, and, yeah. you know, I'll still be here. But That's it's, right. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just the, it's just the motions it's of the ocean. It's a time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I think um, definitely um, people, like people out there are, don't have a lot of money. You know, it's oh, true. Totally. I mean, everything is so expensive. But also, like, I don't expect anybody to buy anything. Like, yeah. you know, I don't expect um, anybody's money unless they want something from me. But it's but, also like, this is like the art of war as well. It's like, find, <laughs> okay, find out, find out other avenues. Like, you know, like, I mean, Damon, my friend, does all these collaborations with plate companies in England and stuff like that, you know, yeah. using his, you know, like if nothing's happening, just fucking go, for, go further out, you know. Get like, that cold calling on, mate. Like, well, not just... even cold calling, just find out, like, you know, find out what other people are doing who, you know, you know what I mean? Like, um, really? whether it's you, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, so... I love that. You just got to keep persisting. Got to hustle. And, yeah, and just hustle. And like, even like, you know, in um, COVID, like, what's that thing called Red Bubble? Like, oh, yeah. I put a whole lot of my paintings as t shirts and t like red caps and stuff like that up there. In COVID, I made about four grand out of that, like, for, no you know, for nothing, really. Yeah. Like, you know, and like, 
it's pretty lame, you know, but four grand is four grand. Like, you know. Well, you're not doing pet portraits yet, so you can you can recover I, from red bubble. Yeah, I know. And you know, <laughs> I got I got in there when it was hot. Yeah. 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 Um, no, but and also drop shipping's not bad. You just gotta tee it up correctly, I I think, and check all the supplies and whatever. Of course, of course. Um but Michael, it was so lovely talking to you. Happy fucking birthday! Oh, doll. thank you. Yeah, you too. Um, I think everybody's <laughs> birthday is today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I absolutely love talking to you. Yeah, that was um, fun. Was there any last pieces that you wanted to say for me? Not, not really. Um, no. But okay. thank you. It's um interesting chat. This episode was recorded on Yagra and Turable land. Sovereignty was never ceded. The episode was produced by myself, Madeline Butini. And if you would like to support 1800 Madbutt, you can head to my website, madbutt.com.au, or you can also go to our Instagram and follow us there. Of course, we appreciate any reviews, so please leave us one if you love it. And yeah, hope to see you again. Thank you. Please hang up and try again.